Hey guys, and welcome to another tutorial slash demonstration where we'll be looking at how to create a handy environment shading rig and also using the latest version of the CrowdInit add-on to render this scene pretty quick. So this is what we'll be looking at making, you can see it on the screen here. And kudos to the person who actually made the model, that wasn't me. So a big shout out goes to, and I might get his name pronounced incorrectly, Nico Rumukainen. Sorry mate if I got that wrong. Um, but he's the real artist and I've put a link to his blend swap page for this particular model in the description below so that you can go check it out. It's a lovely model and it works really well for what we're going to do. And okay, so what are we going to do? Basically create this scene but the purpose behind it is learning a little trick and giving you a tool that you can use in your own scenes which is an environment shading rig. And it's one that's going to work intuitively. I'll give you a little demonstration of it in a sec, but basically the idea behind it is something that you can create a sky that's going to look like this with minimal effort and without tweaking a lot. So I'll show you exactly how the rig works. I'm just going to um, move out of that view, sorry. And I'm going to bring up compositing and I'm going to show the node editor. All right, so here's the environment shader. Now you'll notice it's actually quite simple. We've got basically a sky texture, I've got some curves in here, and that's pretty much it. There's obviously the background node here, I've set the strength to five, but really what makes this rig so handy is that it works basically off the position of the sun. So if you think about making your models or your rigs work intuitively, this is pretty intuitive because pretty much you set the time of day and how the sky looks by moving the sun around. So we've got it right now in what looks like a very late afternoon sort of sunset pose, and that's because the sun is low in the sky. If I move the sun up, you'll notice what happens in a second. When I plonk it down, you'll see that this actually changes, and this sets, the, I suppose, the color of the sky during the day. You can, you can probably see that if I go into shading mode, it's going to look quite different now in the shaded view. It's actually probably going to look quite terrible, so what I'm probably going to do is mute one of these nodes just to give you an idea of what it looks like, because I have tweaked the colors quite a lot. So you can see now the sky here looks very different to how it looked over here. Um, and because I've made some custom edits, I'm actually just going to bypass my color node for a second. So you can see this looks more like midday, and that's because the sun is now directly overhead. So if I put it back where it was, roughly back where it was, you'll notice the sky texture, sun direction, this is the sun direction changes. And if I go back and set it to shaded again, just wait while it updates. Takes a little bit of time, sorry. There, you've got more of an afternoon sort of setting with the sun low on the horizon. Okay, so let's look just a little bit more at the rig before I move into showing you how to do it. So I'm just gonna go into full screen on this. So basically what we've got is the sun lamp, and in the compositor we've got the sky texture. Two, one, two, if I can count my fingers, two elements. And when you move the sun, you'll notice that it actually stays locked to the car. So that's pretty simple to do. All that is, if I actually go and look at the sun, we've got a constraint on here that's attached to the hood of the car, so that the, the sun is always pointing at it. And that just enables me to move the sun around. The sun will always stay oriented to the car and the special trick that I have working here, which I'll show you in a minute, is causing the sun direction for the sky texture, which is separate to the lamp actually, to follow where the sun is looking. So that means no matter where the sun will go, the sky will adjust to roughly what it would look like at that point or time of the day. Okay, so how do we, how do we make this? So we're going to basically leave this file alone for a bit because this is the completed one. So we're going to try and recreate something that looks a bit like this. It won't be exactly the same because I'm not copying the exact same uh, shade of values and everything. So I'm going to just quit. Actually, not quit. I'm going to open up. So this is the original file. So if you go over to Nico's blend swap site and you can use the URL that's in the description, download this file. It's going to look pretty much like this. And when you open this file, you'll notice there is a very handy lighting rig, which is already set up for you, but this, this lighting rig is actually set up for interior lighting, which I'll demonstrate to you in a moment, and we're going to have to get rid of it because of that. So if I load up the shading model, sorry, if I go into shaded mode, then you'll notice that 
we don't have any kind of outdoor environment lighting feel to it. It's very much like a, the car's been photographed in a studio. As you can see, it looks very different. Okay, so I'm going to pause that there. And I'm just going to go ahead and save it. I'm going to save it to a different name. And we're going to start work on the shading rig. So the first thing I'm going to do, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and delete all of all of these mesh lights. So these mesh lights, which have been handily put in here by Nico when he made this, um, just helps make the lighting nice and easy for you. All you really have to do is, I suppose, pose the car and render it if you want to use it. But we're not going to be using any of this because we want to set up our own environment shader mimicking you know outdoors so i'm just going to delete all of that and there is actually one one extra sort of tricky mesh light just down here okay so now we've got all of the lighting rig removed and so what we can do now is start work on the actual environment shader i'm going to use now i do have a couple of computers already connected in crowd render. So this is the crowd rendering, uh, sorry, the crowd render panel, if you haven't seen it before. And this controls connecting to other computers and using them to render. Now I've actually got these computers connected and I'm doing a lot of stuff which our add-on doesn't support. So you'll often see them say sync failed or exited or things like that. Just ignore that for the time being. We're gonna come back and use this later when we actually want to render. Um, we're not gonna render straight away. We've got a lot of work to do to get to that point first. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is go into compositing. We're going to set up the shading rig. And as I said, we, we've already got some elements here. So in the 3D view, we've already got the sun. And in the compositor, sorry, in the environment shader, we've already got a node set up, but it's got the wrong things in it for what we want to do. So we don't want just a color, we're gonna get rid of that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in a sky texture, which you saw in the beginning of the, in, of the video. And this controls the look of the sky. So you can make the sky midday by having the sun direction from directly overhead, which is what this represents. Or you can make the sun set. You can move the sun around the horizon. And when I say sun, I mean the sky mostly. The sky texture does have something that looks a bit like a sun. It's like a sort of a lighter area to it. And if you get the conditions right, it can bloom out and look really impressive. But it's not an actual lamp. It's part of basically the shader for the background. Okay, so we can plug this straight in for now. And the other thing I'm going to do is select the sun. And I'm going to add a track to constraint and I'm going to select the hood of the car. It doesn't really have to be the hood. It could be any part of the car that you want the light to point to. I'm going to select the up to be the Y axis and then I'm going to select minus Z or Z, depending if you, you know, coming from an English speaking background or an American background, we pronounce it differently. Now, if I move the sun around, you'll notice it stays locked to the hood of the car, which is very handy. Um, otherwise, if you moved it, then the direction would not change. So you can, I suppose, do a number of things with this. You can do time-lapse photography where you move the sun on a path through the sky and it stays locked to the car and you can get those shadows that move and change shape as the time of day changes. Or it's just really handy for experimenting with different times of day or different angles of sun without having to just move the sun and then move the direction of the sun and then move the sun and then move the direction of the sun yet again. This way you just move the sun wherever you want it in the sky. You can sort of play God almost in, I suppose, a digital kind of way. And it makes setting things up really easy. But the problem we have at the moment is that the sun direction is fixed. So it's going to look weird because... I could try to make a sunset, but the sky's direction, the sun direction for the sky texture is still directly overhead. So I've got to now make a manual adjustment here, which is not really what we want. I mean, when you're building a rig, you really want something that you can control really easily. So we're going to do something right now that means that wherever I move the sun, uh, the sky is going to follow. So let's do that. So the way to do that is through what we call drivers and a little bit of Python code. So don't get worried if you don't know about much about Python or coding. Um, this is going to be fairly simple. We can do some more complex things maybe in a later video. So I'm going to add a driver to 
the sun direction. So you can see this is called sun direction if I hover the tooltip over it. So I right click it, or you can press Ctrl D, there's a shortcut there for it. And then I'm going to manually create it, single, but later. Click that, and it turns purple to tell me that it's now being driven. I'm also going to save my file here again. And I've currently got auto run disabled or scripts disabled, so I'm going to reload trusted, but I've just saved my file because if you reload trusted, you reload the file and you lose that last change that you made or all the changes up until the point at which you saved it. So we're going to reload trusted. It asks me to revert. I say yes, that's fine. It's going to take a moment or two to think about it. And here we go. All right, good. So we're pretty much ready to go. Um, this, however, is not connected still. So if I move the sun, this stays the same. So we've got to do a little bit more magic to get this to work. And the way that we do that is through the animation view. Well, you don't necessarily have to have the animation view. You need to get to the graph editor. And when you're in the graph editor, you select drivers. And then you'll be able to find this area here where you've got scene untitled because I haven't given the world a title so it's currently untitled you can see that it says untitled here because I haven't set a name for it there um, this is just the shader that shades the background much like you've got a material for a, a mesh you've also got a material for the entire background and that's what we're actually manipulating right now okay so let's zoom into this panel so this is the sun direction so that's that basically this so if I go back into compositing, this guy here, Sun Direction, has got a driver on him, and we can now see that driver in, in a view where we can see the timeline. Um, but we don't want to animate this. We Not directly, at least. That's not going to be as helpful as being able to attach it to the position of the sun, or rather the direction it's pointing in. So what we're going to do is we're going to come over to the tool shelf here, which or the property, sorry, the property shelf, which you bring up just by pressing N on your keyboard or whatever you've mapped that key to. And then we get this panel here. Now I'm going to remove the, the variable one, this variable called var, sorry. And I am going to add two new ones. Now I'll explain what I'm doing in a sec. We're going to leave the setting as scripted expression. There are a few options in here, but we actually want to create our own expression or mathematical expression even for what we're doing. Now the idea behind this is we need to create what's called a vector. So if you want to know what a vector is, um, I advise you to look it up on Wikipedia, but basically it's kind of think of it like an arrow in three dimensions. So an arrow in three dimensions has, it points in the x, the y, and the z direction. And what we're going to do is manipulate those three numbers, which are where it points in the x, y, and z direction, so that, if I just come back into this, we can actually give the, the sun direction this direction here, pointing at the car. So I want to mathematically describe that direction and give it to the sun direction shader. So what we're doing is giving basically three numbers to the driver so that it can drive this. So let's go ahead and do that. So what we're going to do is go into, again, the graph editor. It's set to drivers. And now we're going to add some variables. So I'm going to call this guy hood x and this guy sun x. And I'm calling them the name that we're going to actually look up. And sun, just so I know what I'm dealing with. And we're dealing with the x direction. You can see here it says x. So we want to make sure we use the x direction. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the property of this object. So we've selected an object here, and now we're asked for what what's labeled as the path. Um, when it says path, though, what it's really meaning is, you know, what property of hood do you want? And I want its location. So I want to grab the location of hood, and it'll tell me the value. Um, if you get this wrong, by the way, it turns red. So you know that you've made a mistake. It'll only, it'll only turn gray and give you a number if you've got the right value. And we'll do the same thing for the sun. So all we're doing is getting the x coordinate of hood and the x coordinate of the sun. And then what we're going to do up here is we're going to take hood x and subtract sun x from it. And what that does is it gives us basically a length. It gives us a distance. 
And it will also have either a plus or a minus sign, which basically says you point this way along the x-axis or that way. And the length tells you how long it is. So a vector always has a direction and a length. So the difference between them gives, them, gives us the distance. And the minus or plus sign gives us which direction along the x-axis we point. And by combining x, y, and z in this way, we get a vector or an arrow which points in the direction along that sunbeam. Okay, so we've done that for x. We've got to do exactly the same thing for y. So we're going to repeat this hood y minus sun y for y now. So actually, what I might do is just copy that and then edit it. might make this a bit faster. Plus... Um, Whenever you're programming or doing anything with expressions, it's usually a good idea if you make a variable, just copy and paste it. Purely because if it's a long name, you might misspell it, and misspelling just sucks. Sometimes they're quite difficult bugs to find. Okay, so just repeating the same thing, but for y and the location. I should, probably should have explained a bit more, but location has three numbers. X is the first, which is actually indexed. And when I mean indexed, you get it by putting zero. We're doing Y, which is the second number, which is at one. And then we'll do Z or Z, which is the third number, but is at index location number two, which is sometimes a bit weird and puts people off, but it's just programming. The first element starts at the zero index. So again, I'm gonna put sun location one because it's the second one remember the first one starts at zero uh, and have i spelt this wrong location location one wow okay okay update dependencies there we go that's weird i haven't had that happen before but it seems that update dependencies has solved it for us um, I guess we're learning as we go here with some things like that. But one to remember, if you do have something you're sure that's right, uh, try hitting the update dependencies button because it may be that it, although the path is right, it wasn't able to find it because of some dependency that wasn't up to date. Okay, so now it's telling me my Python expression is not correct. Which, oh, it is. I just had to type it in again. I think what it may be is because I copied and pasted variables which didn't exist before. It didn't like me doing it that way. You should probably create the variables first and actually link them before you do that. But then again, I'm not an expert in the internals of Blender. So location, because it's the Z, which is the one, two, third axis, it's gonna be in location two. And we've got the red saying it's not happy, but we'll sort that in a second. Again, and this is going to be location two. Oh, wait, no, that's sun. <laughs> Don't. Location two. And let's update dependencies. Yeah, okay. So I think what I was doing wrong earlier was not creating the variables before the expression. It seems that if you create the expression and then the variables, it doesn't like it. But now what we've got is... Let's just quickly review it. We've got an x, hood minus sun, hood minus sun, hood minus sun. Now, maybe when you do this, you get them the wrong way around. Um, there's an easy way to tell that, though, and I think I've probably done it the wrong way around, but it serves the purpose of education. So let's put the sun to where we think it's going to be at midday. So I'm just going to do that. And it's the middle of the night. So yeah, we've got these upside down. Um, Remember I said that vectors have a length and a direction, so if you get the direction wrong, um, you can actually change that pretty easy because all direction is with vectors is plus or minus. So all we have to do to repair this is to go back in here, and to each one we're gonna to have to do it, which is a little bit of a pain, but it's much better that we fix it than rather put up with something that's not intuitive, because the whole point of this is to create an intuitive lighting rig. Okay, so we just add this times minus one, which I can copy, and this just flips the vector in the opposite direction, because obviously at the moment the director's pointing the, the vector, the director, the vector is pointing the wrong way. That, that could be a tongue twister, the, the vector director. Say the vector director many, many times. I, I won't, 
because I, I don't want to bore or irritate anyone. All right, so now if we go back into compositing, if I can possibly get my mouse to cooperate. Now this looks a bit more promising. So let's again set the sun to midday directly overhead. That looks a bit better. Am I directly overhead? No, it's just off to one side. So uh, there, okay. That looks pretty much what we want. So now if I just set the sun down here, we can make a late evening. And now if we go into shaded mode and just see what that looks like, we should see that as we change the position of the sun, it should update the sky. Okay, so that's kind of like late afternoon. I might muck around with the strength. The strength looks a bit weak, so let's put the strength up to five. Wow. Cool, that's impressive. It's like a golden golden afternoon. That looks neat. Okay, and just to, just to make sure it's working properly, let's go to something that looks a bit more like midday. Yeah, it looks okay. Sorry, just wait. Ah, huh, okay. Yeah, it looks rad. Now if we go into camera mode, it's a little bit difficult to see a huge improvement in this camera angle though because we've kind of just got the background, the gray background behind it, um, which I haven't changed. I just left it as is um, due to me not having enough time to put something different in. Okay, so that looks pretty fantastic. Um, we can make some improvements to this. Um, the improvements that I made were mainly um, just sticking a RGB curves node in here. Um, so if I load up the original one, you'll see that the only difference between you know, the glory shot, which I showed at the beginning of the video, and this one was having tweaked the curves a little bit. That makes it a little bit less, I suppose, flexible in a way, because you then have to make sure you retweak the curves every time. So I always want to try and make a rig which has the least number of things you have to control, um, which is the reason why I like this rig so much, is because um, if you're happy to use it as is, you've only got one thing to control, and that's where the sun is, and it sets everything else up for you, which is which is pretty nice, you know, from an animation standpoint, uh, the fewer things you have to worry about and control, the better. Okay, so, um, well, we're not really finished yet. Um, we've got to render it, and the camera position is not as good as I would like it to be, purely because, you know, I think in the beginning we had something that looked a little bit like this. Yeah, something like that. So let me just stick the camera there. And then we'll just set up for a render because I do want to show you, um, obviously, the crowd render add on and distributing the render. Now, I've horrendously murdered this file with edits, which means that I'm probably going to have to resynchronize everything. So I'm just going to align the active camera to. Whoa, okay. So why don't I do that first? I'm going to save it here just to make sure if anything crashes, I've got everything. I'm going to open up the crowd render panel, and for sure all these poor computers are probably not synced, or maybe even not online. <laughs> there you go, they've all just quit on me. So they should still be able to connect though, so I'm just going to go and connect to them. Okay, so you can see that they've connected, but they've said sync failed, which means that the file is not the same, because they may have dropped off as I was editing. I might have done something which caused them to basically turn off. So we can fix that by just hitting the resync button. The resync button is going to send them the blend file again. All right, well, you might have noticed I had a bit of an edit there and cut out something. So just to be transparent, what happened was this other computer was basically stuck and I had to go and basically check it out, but it seemed to be okay. And I came back and just basically pressed on resync and now it's re-uploading the blend file and seems to be fine. So fingers crossed it's going to work. So we're at the stage now where we can actually just start rendering stuff if we wanted to, once this other computer says it's synchronized. Again, fingers crossed, hope it syncs. And basically we're gonna use as many computers as we can. Now I'm gonna turn off the computer I'm screencasting from just because I'm also encoding and I'm not sure if this laptop's got enough power to basically render and encode simultaneously without doing weird things to the video or the audio feed. So here we go, we're gonna give this a shot. We're gonna see if we can render this and how it looks. Now I'm just gonna quickly have a look through the camera. Yeah, that looks terrible. 
So because this is all synced now, I can actually make some changes on the fly without having to re-upload the blend file, which is why I wanted to get these things synced. So I can move the camera around, and you'll notice that they say they're still synced, which if you're using just a regular render farm, um, you'd have to upload your entire blend file again. So it's actually quite nice um, being able to sort of creatively monkey around with things like camera angles or even you know lenses. You can change the lens on this. So if you decided that you're too close or too far away and you wanted to change instead of the camera position you wanted to change the lens settings in fact why don't we do that now you can actually do that so let's go up to camera settings and I'm gonna to change to maybe more of a telephoto so let's go 75 mil and then what we can do oh wait that's the sensor width sorry 35 millimeters, the film, you idiot. <laughs> Not the focal length. Okay. I thought that was a bit weird. Okay, maybe I'll go, let's go to 90 mils. And I'm just gonna, look, I'm just gonna monkey with this a little bit more. Pull it back maybe. Up, and I'm not going for, you know, perfection. I'm just going for something that looks Okay. All right, I'm not gonna bore everyone by just continually finicking with this. Now, obviously, you know, you could just preview this in what, in um, in the shader mode in the window. Um, nothing to stop you from doing that. If you've got a powerful GPU, it's gonna help. But one of the things I sort of caution about is make sure before you commit to like either a commercial render farm or you commit to you know, an all night render for a deadline that you've done some test renders with the equipment you're gonna use and that you know that it's gonna look pretty good. Okay, so we've got our computer synced. We've got this one turned off. Um, a little bit about the new stuff in 016, if you haven't seen a couple of live streams we've done, is you can now manually edit load balancing. So manual load balancing means that you can basically just tell the tell the computer, hey, I want you to give, in this case, 79% of the screen area to render three PC and 20% of the screen area to the MacBook Air. Um, obviously, it's MacBook Air. This is a PC with four cores on, so I'm going to give most of it to this computer. So manual mode is really great for situations where you pretty much know how powerful the computers are relative to each other, and you don't want to spend time on training the auto load balancer because the auto mode like this um, it may not get it right the first frame so if you're only doing one frame that's a big one you might want to set the values yourself but if you're doing a long animation it's probably best to leave it on automatic which will automatically readjust the load balancing as the render progresses so let's hit render now and we'll do a bit of a comparison which i'll speed up so we'll see how long it takes with crowd render and how long it takes by itself just doing it on one computer Okay, so we've got the first half of this image back, and man, I could not be happier with that. That looks brilliant. Okay, the other computer's just finished now, and we're just getting the image tile back from it. And we can have a look at the final image now. Okay, let's view it at full size. And there we go. There's a few things that you probably want to fix up. Um, the fact that the tires are sinking through the floor, and the fact that the floor is just a gray mess, but I think that looks pretty good. I actually really like the way that this has been lit in this particular shot. It's different to the one that we did at first, but there you go. So we taught in this video how to use CrowdRender to render something. Um, oh, actually, I um, almost forgot. I'm going to do a comparison render, so I'll set that going while I'm just finishing up. And Okay, so I'm going to set a... Let's just go in here and choose slot 2 so we don't overwrite it. And we'll set a render going on this computer. So this is just cycles by itself. Um, hopefully it's not going to corrupt the video feed a bit too much because it's going to make my computer run slow. Okay, so now that the rendering is finished, we can compare the render time. So if we check here, we can see that the computer which I'm screencasting on, which is a Mac laptop with an i5 chip in, did this in 10 minutes and 19 seconds. Whereas using CrowdRender and another two separate computers, which you can't see, did it in 2 minutes and 23 seconds. 
So that's a pretty big reduction, but I will make this point. You have to understand this in context. Um, to start with, this laptop, which has an i5 chip in it, was also screen casting or recording at the same time as rendering, so it would have got a much better render time than 10 minutes, probably if it wasn't screen casting simultaneously as rendering. Also, the other two computers, one is an i7 chip, which is quite new, and the other is an i5 chip, so I guess you can't directly compare the two results, but in this particular use case of me wanting to record whilst doing a tutorial, tutorial and rendering in the background, it's a pretty good result. You know, having TradRend has really helped me do this a lot faster because, you know, I didn't have to wait eight more minutes for this result. So I hope that demonstrates the usefulness of our add-on. And that's pretty much the end of the video. Um, I hope if you like this that you'll give it a thumbs up. Um, comment as well. If there's something you didn't like, tell us about it. Hopefully we can fix it. And also, please subscribe. We'll be doing more video tutorial slash demonstrations in the future. Also, encourage you to go over to our website, download the current version of 015 of CrowdRender for free, and try it out yourself. And please let us know. Let us know what you think it needs. We're very much design thinking driven here, so we like to feedback from users, and we do listen to it, and we do make changes. And that's it for now, guys. It's been an awesome audience, so thanks, and see you next time.